We're going to open up to Romans chapter 11 first this morning. Once again, Romans chapter 11. And we're continuing with our series of messages this morning in which the Apostle Paul is exhorting us and admonishing us right now that we be not ignorant. And uh, we're on the second of six topics that Paul addresses under the admonition that I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren. Again, six times in his epistles where he uses a similar phrase to that. And uh, with that, of course, six measure um, or six uh, points of doctrine that we need not to be ignorant of. And so we're considering that in this series and uh, the occasion that we have for looking at this um, here in Romans chapter 11, verse 25, where we're exhorted to be not ignorant of the mystery and Israel's temporary blindness. And so just to remind you of this once again, look with me at Romans eleven twenty five. 25. He says, For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel, until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Right, so we started looking at this verse last week and really uh, just kind of consider some of the terminology last week that we're being introduced here in Romans eleven twenty five, 25. And uh, of course, the first thing that we looked at was the issue of uh, the term, the mystery, or this mystery he refers to. And we talked about that term mystery in the general sense of a definition for the way we define that in the word of God. And we found that a mystery simply means a secret, right? Mystery means secret. It does not mean something that's incomprehensible or that's unknowable to man. But it's, it's literally, it means it's a secret. And it was something that was unknown until such time as God chose to reveal it. And when the due time comes for God to reveal his mystery or his secret, then man can know it, right? The information's there and available. And so we talked about the mystery and made sure that we understood that term. And then we also talked about the concept of the blindness in part that he says has happened to Israel. Right? Blindness in part. The chosen nation of the Lord is not seeing the things of their prophecy and covenant program come to pass today. God is doing something else that had not been revealed before in a mystery. And Israel, therefore, in their program and the things of prophecy that they were expecting based upon the covenants and the promises and the prophecies of uh, time past, they're not seeing those things come today. They're blind, uh, blind to, uh, to those things. And uh, therefore, that, that program's not progressing on and they're, they're blinded to it in the present time. But as Paul says that they're blinded, he's also sure to add that this dispensational blindness that they're experiencing for the present time is, in fact, only in part. Right? It's only until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Right? So there's a limited uh, span of time in the, the dealings of God with man in which Israel's experiencing this condition that he refers to as blindness. And, of course, we uh, used this simple timeline here last week to kind of illustrate that point, how that... Israel was the issue in time past, and they were promised the kingdom and God's presence with them on earth, and how that the blessing would go to the Gentiles through Israel. But something happened to this program, kind of midstream here, and uh, there was a, a mystery that was introduced by the Lord Jesus Christ, and this program with Israel is set aside. They're not seeing those things progress on into that kingdom, but God's doing something different, and it's an in-part blindness, which means it's uh, temporary in nature. It's until the fullness of these Gentiles and what God's doing among the Gentiles be fulfilled. And then once that's fulfilled, all Israel shall be saved, as it's written. Verse 26 there of Romans chapter 11. And so God will pick that program back up and take it on to completion. And Israel will have their kingdom. And so we uh, talked a little bit about that last week. And uh, understood a little bit about what this mystery means for Israel and their temporary setting aside. And uh, therefore... Uh, because that has happened and God has made that known that that is uh, what he had willed to do and what he had purposed to do, you and I need not be ignorant of it. We need to know what this mystery is about and understand what's happened to Israel and their program. And, uh, of course, doing that and knowing that lest we be wise in our own conceits, which is Paul's warning there in Romans eleven twenty five. And so uh, with that short review, I want you to turn back with me now to Acts chapter 13. And I want to show you another passage that I think fits with this. And I actually intended to uh, close out with this passage last time and then unintentionally uh, skipped over it as we were talking about things. But I think that this is a passage here in Acts 13 that goes along with this idea of the in part blindness of Israel and signifies and, and kind of shows us in type how that it is a, a temporary arrangement that they find themselves in. And... There's a truth here that I think in what takes place in some 
real events with the Apostle Paul and with uh, a Jewish sorcerer that's named here in Acts 13 that's really typical of where Israel finds themselves dispensationally concerning being blinded to the things of their program. And so, as I've already said, it involves a Jewish sorcerer, right? a Jewish sorcerer, which is a significant detail in type. He's a false prophet, and his name is actually Bar-Jesus, right? son of Jesus is what that means. And he also uh, is known here, and you'll see it in the text as we read, by the name of Limus. And as Paul and Barnabas are coming into uh, the town preaching the word of God and sharing the truth of God with the people, and with the deputy in particular, Sergius Paulus, it's named here, Elimus withstands the word of God. This Jewish sorcerer is opposing the message that Paul and Barnabas are bringing into the town. And so what happens here is, of course, written by Luke or recorded by Luke. It's an actual event that took place early on in Paul's first journey. But in addition to recording the event as it took place on Paul's journey, I think that it's written also because it's, it is typical of what the purpose of the book of Acts is, and that is communicating to Israel what's happened to their program, right? And you can see that typified here in the way that this, uh, this account goes. And so let's pick up here in uh, Acts chapter 13, verse number 6. The Bible says, And when they had gone through the isle unto Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew, whose name was Bar-Jesus, which was with the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man, who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. But Elimus the sorcerer, for so is his name by interpretation, withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. Then Saul, who also is called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him, and he said, O full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, Wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee. And thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist of darkness, and he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. And then the deputy, when he saw what was done, believed, being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. So you can see the account of what's taking place there. Right? You've got a Jewish sorcerer. Withstanding the word of God and the preaching of the faith by uh, the Apostle Paul and by Barnabas who's accompanying him at this time. And really what's, what's taking place here, you see that as he's withstanding the word of the Lord, Paul, as, as the Lord would have it, sets his eyes on this man and he rebukes him for withstanding the word of God and trying to keep the deputy from the faith. And he, as he rebukes him, he tells him that what's going to take place with this Jewish sorcerer is that you're going to experience blindness. Right? And this, this darkness falls upon this guy where he no longer can see the sun. But you notice in the way that he describes this in verse number 11 there, he says that the hand of the Lord is upon thee and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. In other words, the blindness that he's experiencing is only temporary, isn't it? Right? It's not perpetual. It's not a permanent thing that's being placed upon this guy, but it's for a season. Right? You're going to be blind for a season. Well, folks, that sounds pretty typical of what Paul was explaining back in Romans 11, 25 concerning Israel, doesn't it? Amen. Right? Concerning those Jews. that They have a blindness in part that has happened to them. They've been withstanding the word of God in their program, right? They've not accepted. They're not with God. They're acting more like the children of the devil rather than the children of God. Right? Apostate Israel in relation to that. They're responding the same way to Paul and the message of, of grace that he's been bringing. And they're withstanding that message. And they're, they're really siding with the devil. And in connection with that, their unbelief and their, their rejection and repudiation of the word of God. You've got a nation now that's being put in a state of blindness while salvation goes to the Gentiles. But it's a blindness in part. It's blindness for a season. And you notice that he says that he's going to be blinded not seeing the sun for a season. Right, not seeing the sun. Right? The sun rises, doesn't it? Yes. Right? It rises to its height and it, it shines down upon the earth. Well, nationally speaking and dispensationally speaking, that too is what happened to Israel. Right? Their program's going along. They're expecting that the kingdom of God and of Christ, or they should have been according to the scripture, that that was going to be established. 
Right? Malachi chapter 4 verse 2 talks about how that the son of righteousness will arise with healing in his wings. Right? On behalf of the nation. And Isaiah 60 verse 1, it talks about how that the glory of the Lord would rise upon them. And the glory of the Lord would shine upon Israel in that kingdom where they'd have their blessings. And the fulfillment of the covenants and all those things going to the Gentiles through their rise. Well, there's, coming a, there's a point here where with the connection with what's happened to Paul... Right? He's been saved, he's been commissioned, he's been given the message concerning this mystery. It's going to be going to these Gentiles. And he says that a blindness in parts happened to Israel where they're blind and it's for a season. And they're not going to see the issue of the son of righteousness arise in that kingdom for a time. It's going to be a season where they're blinded to that. Not seeing that come to pass. Again, it's seasonal. It's in part. Until something else takes place. That, that, that's... That's typical of the issue that he's talking about with national Israel in Romans chapter 11. Blindness in part. In part. Temporary. Seasonal. Are words that describe the current and, and the present arrangement of God's dealings with the nation of Israel. Temporarily set aside. And so we can see that. And uh, we see that this blindness in part is a seasonal issue. And because that has happened, we, it needs to be appreciated as such. Lest we become wise in our own conceits. Realize it is a temporary issue. This is not the thing that's permanent. right? And we're going to see some things as we go along in this section of the study where that, that has importance. And uh, why we need to recognize that and why it's a dangerous thing not to. Okay, and so Paul's emphasizing that. Now, I want to expand upon that further. That, that concept of Israel's blindness and what that means and, and why we don't need to be wise in our own conceits in relation to that. But before we can really get into the heart of that matter, we kind of need to make sure that we all have a basic working understanding of God's program with Israel. I'm talking about it very high level in that very simple timeline there, but I think that it's important in order to appreciate it for what it is to be able to at least have a basic working understanding of what God's program with Israel was, what it was based on, what it was unto, and that type of thing. And so that's what we're going to try to spend the time this morning doing is giving a recap of uh, Israel's program and just make sure that we all kind of level set and understand in a basic way what God's program of Israel was all about, how it got started, uh, what it involved and what the expectation was when this mystery was revealed and the blindness in part happened to them and it, it needs to be appreciated uh, in its own right. And so we're going to take the time this morning to, to do that and then based on that we'll be able to get into some of these matters and uh, look at why it's such a big deal to the Apostle Paul and what he's saying there in Romans chapter 11. So to get underway with this, let's go back to the book of Romans. And I want you to go first to Romans chapter 9. And uh, by the way, I put a list of verses over here on the side, just kind of as a cheat sheet. I'm planning to run through a number of verses this morning. And so if you get lost, we'll be in one of those passages. And uh, hopefully you can catch back up with us. But uh, Romans chapter 9 is where I want to start this morning as we're going to be Recapping Israel's program. And I just want you to notice here in Romans 9, as Paul's talking about Israel and time past, he's going to list out some advantages that they had. And he talks about that here in Romans chapter 4, or chapter 9 rather, verse 4. His kinsmen according to the flesh, he calls them, who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises Whose are the fathers, and of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who was over all, God blessed forever. Amen. And so Paul there lists out quite, a, quite a, a, a list of things that he says that pertain to Israel. Yeah. A lot of spiritual advantages to Israel, right? You have no mention of Gentiles there having any of those things. Right? These are things that pertain to Israel. The adoption, and the glory, and the covenants, and the promises. And Christ came to Israel, right? He was their Messiah. He was their king. And he came to them. And they had all this spiritual privilege because they were the nation Israel. God's chosen nation in time past. They had access to privilege, uh, access to God, advantage toward God. They were said to be nigh unto God while the Gentiles were in a condition of being far off. All these things belong to Israel. Spiritual advantage after spiritual advantage belonging to a single nation in the earth who had the true God so nigh unto them. As Moses told him in Deuteronomy chapter 4. Now if you go to Ephesians chapter 2, you see a very stark contrast to that as he's addressing what that meant for Gentiles. You've got Israel over here with all of the spiritual advantage of access. All the spiritual privilege. And Ephesians chapter 2, he tells you what all the other nations had. 
right? Israel's a single nation. You've got a bunch of other nations that we refer to as Gentiles. What did they have in time past? Right? And we could say, what did we have in common in time past? Right? Because we're all Gentiles and have a Gentile heritage. Yeah. Ephesians chapter 2, look at it, verse 11. Paul says, Wherefore, remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision, by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time ye, that is ye Gentiles, uncircumcised Gentiles, ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. And that's quite a contrast when you compare that to Israel, wouldn't you say? Yes. Right, that, that's a significant spiritual contrast. Israel's got all the advantages. The Gentiles have all the disadvantages. Mm -hmm. Everything that was going for Israel was going against the Gentiles. Yeah. Stark contrast. Mm -hmm. Now you say, well, why was that? Why is God showing such preference for, you know, this, this little nation Israel and all these other Gentiles where the vast majority of the human population is found? Why is there such a, a big difference where Israel gets the preferential treatment and the Gentiles have so many disadvantages? Why was that? Well, you can start to see how this came about if you go back to Genesis chapter 12. All right. Genesis chapter 12. Now, the backstory here for Genesis 12, you have to appreciate what's taken place through the first 11 chapters, really. And, of course, the kind of creation and Adam and the fall and all that type of thing. But specifically, just before you get to Genesis 12, the, the thing that has taken place and that you were confronted with last was this issue of Noah and the flood. All right, Noah and the flood. All right, God... Uh, destroys uh, every living thing on the earth with the, the flood by water. And you've got Noah's ark and his, his family, the eight souls that get on the ark are the preserved through that judgment. And they come out on the other side. And back there when they come off the ark, God had made some provision for some things where now to Noah and to his sons, he's going to say, I want you to go forth and replenish the earth. Right? And God put some things in place that's to aid man in that endeavor to cause him to spread abroad upon the face of the earth. Uh, allows man to hunt the animals, and he puts the fear and dread of man in animals so that the animals will run from them, so that they've got to chase them down, and that in and of itself is supposed to naturally cause men to begin to spread out and to serve in God's purpose to replenish the earth. All right, so you've got Noah and his sons after the flood. The, the will of God is for them to spread abroad, and the nations, of course, are going to come out of this, this, these three branches of Noah's sons. In fact, if you look at chapter 10... Verse 32, you can see a reference to that, how the, the nations of the earth uh, come forth from Noah and his sons. Uh, 1032, he says, these are the families of the sons of Noah after their generations in their nations. And by these were the nations divided in the earth after the flood. All right, so nations are going to come forth through the three sons of Noah. God institutes human government, which is going to be important for the administration of the post-flood world with these nations. And God's will is for the, these nations to spread abroad. He wants them to replenish the earth and to follow the will of God and his purpose for the earth. Well, you get into chapter 11 after you see these nations being developed there at the end of chapter 11 from Noah's sons. And instead of spreading abroad upon the face of the earth, you find them joining in rebellion against that. And instead of spreading abroad, they decide they're going to come together. All right, they come together lest we be scattered. And they begin to build this tower here that comes to be known as Babel. They say, we're doing that in order to make us a name. We want to build a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. And this right here is an act of direct rebellion against the word of God that he has commissioned those nations with. Right? He said, spread out. They said, no. Instead, we're coming together. And they actually are joining in alliance with the adversary and his purpose to, to fight against the purpose of God on earth, what they're doing. Right? They are becoming the alliances of the adversary himself in rebellion to God. That's what the nations are doing. Yeah. All right, well, God comes down in, in Genesis 11. He sees what they're doing there in their rebellion. He confounds their language, and that, of course, causes them to have to divide up into their language groups and uh, go across the earth and, and, and spread abroad with that. And he thwarts their purpose at Babel. 
And in Romans chapter 1, when Paul's looking back at what had happened in relation to the, the history of the Gentiles or the nations, he makes it pretty clear, based on the way that I read Romans chapter 1, that this right here, this event, is where God gave up and gave over those nations yeah. to the power of darkness. Yeah. Right? The power of Satan, we would say. God just kind of wipes his hands with them, so to speak. And he says, I'm not going to utilize the nations any longer in my purpose. Yeah. They've decided they want the adversary's ways. They've, they've aligned themselves with that. They're serving in that. You can have it. And he gives them over to the power of darkness. I'm not going to utilize the nations for my purpose on earth any longer. That's what's happened in Genesis chapter 11. Now it's out of that. You come into Genesis chapter 12. And it's significant that you find God identifying a single man in the midst of those nations. And he's going to give him a commandment. His name, of course, is Abram, or he'll become, come to be called, known as, uh, called Abraham. And he gives him a, a command to come out of that nation, separate from your family and kindred, and I'm going to do something with you. All right, and that's what we find here in Genesis 12, verse 1. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Now here, Genesis 12, verses 1 to 3 constitutes what's typically referred to as the Abrahamic covenant, right? After battle, Abraham's called out of the Chaldees. God's giving him a promise here of some things, and we call that the Abrahamic covenant. God's making covenant with Abraham. And you notice that as part of this covenant, God begins to declare a change in the world concerning his dealings with men. I've already told you in Genesis 11 concerning the nations in plurality that came forth from Noah, he's wiped his hands with those. I'm not using those nations anymore. But he says of this man, Abraham, that he's called out, he gives him the promise of what I'm going to do with you, Abram, is I'm going to make of you a great nation. See? No longer working with nations, plural, right. but I'm going to create a nation, right? a nation of my own creation, from the seed that will issue forth from Abraham, and of you, I'm going to make a great nation. And with this nation that I'm going to create from your seed, I'm giving you a land, right? I'm going to take you into a land, and in that land, I'm going to make this great nation of your seed a blessing. I'm going to bless you, and through the blessing that I bless you with, that's how my blessing is going to go to all families of the earth. Right? So in wiping his hands of the nations, that doesn't mean that God hates the Gentiles, doesn't mean that he doesn't purpose and want to save the Gentiles. Right. But in view of what's taking place and what God has made known, the way he's going to get to those Gentiles is not through direct involvement any longer, but it's going to be through this great nation that he says I'm going to create through Abraham's seed. Yeah. Right? And he gives him promises in connection with that. The Abrahamic covenant. I'm going to give you the land. I'm going to give you that seed that's going to grow into a na great nation, and I'm going to make you a blessing. And if those nations want blessing... From the Lord, they want to return to the Lord, so to speak, forsake the vanity of their idolatry and the power of darkness and come to the light. The way that they're going to do that is coming through the agency of Israel. Because I'm going to bless those that bless you, God says. Right? Bless those nations and those people that bless his people, Israel. God's declaring a change in the world. Not working with the Gentiles or the nations any longer. I'm going to work with this one great nation that comes forth from Abraham's seed. The Abrahamic covenant. Now, of course, that involves the kingdom. Right? The blessing is out here in this kingdom. That's where the world's going to be blessed. Israel's exalted. They're going to be blessed. And their blessings go out to the nation. So the kingdom is resident in what he's promising in that Abrahamic covenant. I'm going to do my kingdom purpose on earth with the nation I create from you. All right? So that tells you something about where the distinction begins to be declared, right? There, there is no nation here yet. It's just Abram. He doesn't even have seed yet. No children. But God's declaring a purpose of what he's going to do with him. And he starts talking about a difference of administration in the world through a single nation, the nation Israel. Now, if you hop over to Genesis 17, 
I'll show you another important point of distinction that gets introduced with Abraham. And this is uh, Genesis 17 and verse 19, and this is going to concern the issue of circumcision. Genesis 17, verse 9. It says, And God said unto Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant, therefore, thou and thy seed after thee in their generations. This is my covenant, which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. Every man child among you shall be circumcised. And you shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you, every man child in your generations. And he that's born in the house, and he that is bought uh, with money of any stranger, which is not of thy seed, he that is born of thy house, and he that is bought with thy money, must needs be circumcised, and my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant." And the uncircumcised man-child whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people. He hath broken my covenant. So a little bit later on from where he's declaring the Abrahamic covenant, you've got the, introduction, uh, the introduction of uh, the, the, the token of circumcision, the token of the covenant, he says. Paul calls it the sign of circumcision in Romans 4.11. It was a sign that was a fleshly distinction that essentially it signified that the Lord's covenant is with these circumcised people. Right? He says, this is my covenant between me and you. Right? It's not between me and everybody else and all the other nations. This is my covenant between me and you. Right? It's a, a fleshly distinction that's a representation of that covenant. Jehovah's covenant is with them. It's not with the uncircumcised nations. You remember in Ephesians chapter 2, we read it, that the Gentiles were called uncircumcision Amen. by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands. Amen. Right? God's putting a difference there. He's putting a difference. And he's putting a sign of that difference in their flesh with this token of circumcision. God's making a difference. Israel's the chosen nation. All the other nations are not. Right? Israel's the chosen, the Gentiles are not. Difference. Now, as things develop here in Genesis, this Abrahamic covenant goes on to be confirmed with Isaac in time. Right? That's the seed of Abraham. The promised seed. God says, I'm going to do this covenant, and I'm going to give it to Isaac. And Isaac shall thy seed be called. And then from Isaac, of course, he has a son named Jacob. Jacob and Esau. And the covenant is confirmed with Jacob. Right? Jacob's also given the name Israel. Israel means prince or ruler with God. Right? And that term Israel signifies what God purposes to do with the nation that's going to come through that line of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They're going to rule with God here in a kingdom. Yep. They're going to be a princes, God's princes, so to speak, on the earth. Amen. Israel, he's called. And then from uh, Israel, or Jacob, of course, he, had, he begets 12 sons that become the heads of the 12 tribes of Israel. Right? 12 tribes coming forth from those, those sons. They end up down in Egypt by the end of the book of Genesis, and they begin to multiply down in Egypt. They have the Pharaoh that arises that knows not Joseph. They go under cruel bondage and the taskmasters. And in time, and according to the promise of God, he visits his people down there in Egypt, and he sends Moses to be the deliverer. Right? He sends Moses and he says to Pharaoh, let my people go that they may serve me. Right? It's time for me to take them out of Egypt, to take them back to that land and fulfill my promises with them. And you've got the Lord there attacking all the gods of Egypt, mm -hmm. devastates all the things that they worship. He, he declares his name in all the earth, as the Bible says, through what he does there in Egypt. Puts the fear and dread of, of the Lord Jehovah upon the nations as they're hearing the rumblings of what he did there in Egypt and this people that are coming out that are called by his name. He's declared his name through all the earth. He, he brings them out after that tenth plague, parts the Red Sea, takes them over into the wilderness, teaches them some things, provides for some things for them there in the wilderness by his, his sheer goodness and his grace and who he is. And, and out, of, uh, out of his own goodness, he provides everything for them. He bears them on eagle's wings, he says, and brings them unto himself. And then they come to the base of Mount Sinai. 
They come to the base of Mount Sinai. And I want you to see this in Exodus 19 if you go ahead and turn there. After seeing all the goodness of the Lord to them and how he made a difference between them and the Egyptians in Egypt and how he took care of them in the wilderness up to the point of Sinai, the Lord here is going to offer them a proposition for how they want to go into that land and be dealt with. And in Exodus 19, we're concerned with uh, the first eight verses here. Exodus 19, verse 1, he says, In the third month, when the children of Israel were gone forth out of the land of Egypt, the same day came they into the wilderness of Sinai, for they were departed from Rephidim, and were come to the desert of Sinai, and had pitched in the wilderness, and there Israel camped before the mount. And Moses went up unto God, and the Lord called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shalt thou say unto the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians. And how I bear you on eagles' wings and brought you unto myself. Now, therefore, right, in view of everything that you've seen to this point, now, therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me. Now, he's already shown them that they're his peculiar treasure, the chosen nation. But now the issue is that he's offering them a choice of how they think all this is going to get accomplished with them. You've seen what I did. And they also had seen what they did, which was not good. But they've seen it at this point. And he says, now, here's the, here's the choice. right? You can either continue to be dealt with on basis of what I can do for you. Or you can do it by your own performance. And if you'll obey and you'll keep and you'll do, then you can make yourself fit to be my peculiar treasure. Above all people, for all the earth is mine. Verse 6, And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. And Moses came and called for the elders of the people and laid before their faces all these words which the Lord commanded him. All right, so he presents it to them. Notice what they say in verse 8 now. He says, And all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord hath spoken, we will do. And Moses returned the words of the people unto the Lord. Now, on the surface, that might sound great, yep. right? In lip service to say that whatever the Lord said, that's what we're going to do. Sounds good. But the truth of the matter is that what's happening here at Sinai is a disaster for Israel. Yep. It's a disaster for Israel because it demonstrates that they have not learned the lessons about who they are as a, as a people who are naturally sinful and not inclined to his ways. They have not learned that what they need is the Lord to provide for them everything that they are not so that they can be a peculiar people and a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. They've not learned that. And actually, they're spitting in the face of all that by saying, Lord, we don't really need you to do it for us because we think we're naturally righteous and we're naturally holy to go into that land and to function as the peculiar people that your plan calls us to be. We really don't need you involved in that other than blessing us for how good we are. That's what they're saying. All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. All right? Not, Lord, receive us graciously. We're sinners that have no ability to keep your law and to do your commands. No, we'll do all that you say. All that you're spoken, we'll do. And they elect to go under a performance contract. An if-then conditional contract. Not where God's just freely blessing them, but blessing or cursing based upon their own performance. God doing something to them and with them because of what they do. Blessing for obedience. Cursing for disobedience. That's the other side of that piece when it's conditional. Well, if you turn over to Leviticus 26, you start getting some words of that law. This if-then principle that they've agreed to, to be dealt with by performance. You start seeing what that's going to entail. And how that's going to go based on their obedience or disobedience. Leviticus 26. Again, Leviticus is part of this law that they're going under. Moses is writing here and he talks a little bit about this. And if you look at verse 3 and 4 and 5, you're going to see that he begins the first part of this chapter by talking about conditional blessings. Right? If you're obedient, this is what you can expect. And you see the if-then terminology coming up here as well. Leviticus 26.3. He said, if ye walk in my statutes and keep my commandments and do them, then, right, if you do, then this is going to happen. 
I will give you rain in due season, and the land shall yield her increase, and the trees of the field shall yield their fruit. And your threshing shall reach into the vintage, and the vintage shall reach into the sowing time, and ye shall eat your bread to the full, and dwell in your land safely. And on and on it goes through the chapter there of all the blessings that they can expect that are going to come upon them if they do everything God said. Mm -hmm. If you keep the law, blessings what you're going to get. But there's another side to that, right? Mm -hmm. If you don't do it, you get some other stuff. And he starts talking about that side of the coin down in verse 14. And you can see the contrast word there to begin the verse, but. All right? If you obey, you get blessings, but if you will not hearken unto me and will not do all these commandments, and if, you're, uh, if you shall despise my statutes and your soul abhor my judgments so that you will not do all my commandments, but that you break my covenant, I also will do this unto you. All right, here it comes. I will even appoint over you terror, consumption, and the burning of you that shall consume the eyes and cause sorrow of heart. And you shall sow your seed in vain, for your enemies shall eat it. And I will set my face against you, and uh, you shall be slain before your enemies. They that hate you shall reign over you, and you shall flee when none pursueth you. On it goes through the chapter. Curse after curse after curse that's promised to them if they don't keep the law. When you go into that land, this is the standard you're going to be held to. This is what you agreed to be dealt with by your performance in the land. And when you don't do all my commandments, curse after curse after curse is what you can expect. Conditional. Blessing and cursing based on... <coughs> Uh, their obedience or disobedience. And what you find here as you read through Leviticus 26 is that there's actually five demarcations of curses where he tells them that these things are successively going to come upon them. It's going to get worse and worse and worse as you continue to persist. I'm going to bring a little bit of the curses on you. And what that ought to do is cause you to return to the covenant, forsake the wrong way and come back to the right way. But if it doesn't reform you and you're not brought back by these, this round of curses... It's going to get seven times worse for you, and I'm going to bring more on you. And then it's going to get seven times worse, and I'm going to bring more on you. And he goes through that five times where it's curse upon curse upon curse, which we've got represented here by these red numbers. And I refer to these as the five courses of punishment for Israel that are promised in the law. All right? When they disobey, they expect these, should expect these things to be coming upon them during their time in the land there. Right? This is a covenant that they've made between Israel and the Lord. Now, we already know what's going to happen. Right? Joshua takes them into the land there. They're in the land. They're going to be held to account to the law now. And after Joshua's generation dies off, they quickly turn out of the way. They don't stay with the Lord. They turn after the, the gods of the Gentiles in the land that they failed to drive out. And they end up doing worse than the heathen that dwelt in the land before they got there. And they persist, and they persist, and they persist, and they show themselves to be that stiff-necked people that the prophets say that they are. And what you see working out through the history as you get into the book of Judges, right? Judges starts there following Joshua and running from Judges to Second Chronicles. You've got the history of Israel and their time that's in the land here. And it's disobedience after disobedience after disobedience. And therefore, what you're reading about in that history is curse after curse after curse coming on them. And you can actually match up what takes place in Israel's history through those five courses of punishment right here in the law in Leviticus 26. What God says you're going to get in successive order is exactly what the history lays out. These curses coming upon them during their time in the land. Now, before we leave this, cast your eyes down here to verse 32. In Leviticus 26. And look at where all this ends up. All right, once they're in the land, they've gone through the successive courses of punishment. They've come to the fifth and final course of punishment that the law talks about. What's that going to entail for them as an end of their time in the land? Verse 32. He says, And I will bring the land into desolation, and your enemies will dwell therein, or that dwell therein shall be astonished at it. And I will scatter you among the heathen. The heathens, the Gentile nations. And I will draw a sword after you, and your land shall be desolate and your cities waste. And then shall the land enjoy her Sabbaths, as long as it lieth desolate, and ye be in your enemies' lands, even then shall the land rest and enjoy her Sabbaths. As long as it lieth desolate, it shall rest, because it did not rest in your Sabbaths, 
when you dwell upon it. All right. So one of the one of the key features of the fifth and final course of punishment there is that when they rebel and rebel and rebel, it's going to get to the place where there's really no remedy. They're not being reformed by these curses. And the end of that is going to be that they're going to end up scattered among the heathen. Right? They came in under Joshua, and they were kicking the heathen out of the land. Right? The Gentiles that dwelt there, they were kicking out. God was with Israel, kicking the heathen out. But now they do worse than the heathen. They've rebelled, and God says, I'm going to use those heathen Gentiles to come in, and you, Israel, are going to get kicked out of the land. It's scattered among the heathen expelled from that land. The land's going to be desolate. The city's laid waste. Destruction in the land is where the curses of, of uh, punishment, the courses of punishment, end up as they approach that fifth and final course. Now, he mentions the land having its rest and enjoying her Sabbaths. Now, that is another issue that is a provision of the law, and essentially, just to summarize that, it's talked about in chapter 25, but every seventh year, they were supposed to give that promised land rest. Right? They weren't to sow it like every other year, but every seventh year, the land was to have a Sabbath. You let it rest. You don't sow, you don't plow, you just let the land rest. And the idea is that while they're dwelling in that land, they're not obeying the law, so every time that seventh year rolls around, or the land's supposed to be resting, they just continue right on plowing and sowing, and they disregard that completely. And that goes on and on and on during their time in the land to the point where them being kicked out of it gets tied to the fact that all those land Sabbaths that you didn't observe while you were dwelling upon the land, I'm going to take you out, and I'm going to reclaim all those Sabbath years that you skipped while you were in the land. For every Sabbath year you skipped, I'm going to take it back. You're going to be over here in the land of your enemies. Israel's not going to be in the land. And the land's going to have its rest and enjoy her Sabbath while you're not on it. All right? So that's, that's the issue. That's why they're scattered among the heathen, taken off the land into captivity. Amen. Okay? And he's tying that to the issue of the land Sabbath. Now, come to uh, 2 Chronicles 36. There's more to say about those land Sabbaths, but I at least want you to understand the uh, connection that's being drawn there and the... the the captivity and the reasons for it, because in Second Chronicles 36, there's actually a number of years that gets fixed to this, and through the prophet Jeremiah, once they're historically over here at this time where that's taking place with them, he's going to mention it and tie it right back to that issue of the land Sabbaths in Leviticus 26. And so look here in Second Chronicles 36, verse 15. It says, And the Lord God of their fathers... Sent to them by his messengers, rising up be times and sending, because, because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they mocked the messengers of God and despised his words and misused his prophets until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people till there was no remedy. Therefore he brought upon them the king of the Chaldees, who slew their young men with the sword in the house of the sanctuary. And had no compassion upon young man or maiden, old man or him that stoopeth for age. He gave them all into his hand. All right, so he's coming into the land. The Gentiles coming in, taking them captive. And then skip down to verse 20. He says, And them that had escaped the sword carried he away to Babylon, where they were servants to him and his sons until the reign of the kingdom of Persia. Verse 21. Now he says, To fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths. For as long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill threescore and ten years. All right, so Jeremiah the prophet's coming along and he's fixing a time frame to that captivity and their, their absence from the land. Seventy years, right? That's threescore and ten. Seventy years. Seventy Sabbaths are going to be reclaimed while they're off the land amongst their enemies. All right? And so you've got the time frame there of the 70 years that especially gets determined in the desolations of Jerusalem. Now, when Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians come in there and take them off the land, there's a young man named Daniel that's a part of that, those, those waves of, of the seeds and the captivity. If you turn to Daniel chapter 9... As a young man who's lived the majority of his life as a captive in Babylon, 
Those 70 years are nearing their end, and they're coming to the time when that 70 years is about gone. And Daniel comes to understand this through reading the prophet Jeremiah, and no doubt uh, from Leviticus and the books that he references here. And he realizes that this 70-year period is about complete. And so he's wanting to know uh, some further things about what God's program with Israel is going to entail. Daniel chapter 9, look at verse 1 and 2. You can see him recognizing the time. Daniel 9, 1. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the seed of the Medes, which was made king of the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the years, whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. All right, there's the three score and ten. All right, he's coming to understand that as a captive in Babylon, and no doubt he's counting up the years and he's seeing that that time frame is about over. Well, what's next mm -hmm. for Israel? All right, the 70 years are accomplished. What's next? And so he sets his face to pray to the Lord, confesses the national transgressions of his people in relation to the law covenant as the law had commanded him to do. And in response to that, that response of Daniel in compliance with what the law had said that he ought to do, God sends Gabriel the angel to come and to give him further light and to tell him, some things about God's plan and purpose for the remainder of God's program with Israel. Amen. All right, so he does that, and he picks up in verse 24, and the angel says, Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon uh, thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Right, so he's giving him a time frame which, in which the whole thing is going to be wrapped up. Right? The most holy is going to be anointed. You've got all these things taken care of. Right? He's talking about the end of Israel's program. Seventy weeks as a period of time that's determined for the completion of that program. Then he gives you a breakdown of those 70 weeks, beginning in verse 25, where he says, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks, and threescore and two weeks, and the street shall be built again, and the wall, even in troublous times. And after threescore and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood. And unto the end of the war, desolations are determined. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. For the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. All right, so he's, he's giving you a breakdown of this 70-week time period. Now, when he talks about 70 weeks, the way to understand that is he's talking about 70 sevens. Right? Uh, we talk about a, a week of days, that's seven days, right? Well, the Bible also has the principle of a week of years, right? which would be seven years. Right? That, that concept of uh, really the land Sabbath back here would be that kind of concept. Right? Every seventh year, you're supposed to let the land rest. That, that's a week of years, seven years. The 70 weeks is 70 weeks of years. Right? Seven years in each week. Mm -hmm. All right? So he begins to break down the 70 weeks. He talks about seven-week period. Seven times seven is 49. Right? So there's a 49-year period there where the wall is going to be built. The street's going to be built again in Jerusalem from the destruction that took place with uh, Nebuchadnezzar, when the Babylonians came in, mm -hmm. a remnant is going to be allowed to return to do that rebuilding. Mm -hmm. Ezra and Nehemiah, yep. time frame. And then there's uh, what he says is three score and two weeks, or 62 weeks, which is a total of 432 years following that time, after which Messiah is going to be cut off. Right? That would point to the cross of Calvary when you're lining this up with the Gospels. Okay? And then finally, there's a prince that's coming who is a reference to Antichrist, he's going to confirm the covenant at a point here after Messiah has been cut off for one week, which is seven years. Yeah. All right, so you've got seven, 62, and one to total the 70. Right? And you've got this, this time frame that's laid out. There's some things following Messiah being cut off there that had to be fulfilled in prophecy that's awaiting the time for the, the covenant to be confirmed. But a time frame here in the sketch of these 70 weeks where... He's telling Daniel, post-captivity here, that's the time frame to finish up God's program with Israel. 
All right, there's some things that are going to be happening. He's telling them the, the timeline, the basic structure of what's going to happen in relation to Jerusalem in particular, where a number of years have to be fulfilled for God's program with Israel to be completed. And then after that, the kingdom of Christ will be established, the anointing of the most holy, and so on. And then you're going to have that great nation that God's formed, regathered from their scattered state into the land. They're exalted in the kingdom, blessed in the kingdom with Christ there in their midst. And through their blessing then, in the land, the blessing goes out and blesses all the families of the earth. Right? He's reaching the Gentiles through the kingdom, right? the fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant. Right? So we've got a time frame for the expectation for that. Now, there's, there's obviously this, this time frame here, this timeline. There's a lot of things that happen, obviously, throughout the Word of God that's not on this timeline. Right? We all understand that. Many details that take place along this timeline. But from Old Testament scriptures this morning, what we've been able to do is piece together the framework of God's program with Israel Really from the foundation of the world and especially the calling out of Abraham all the way through prophetically. God saying ahead of time what's going to be, how it's going to go until it's concluded in his kingdom. Amen. All right? Amen. We've pieced all of that together from Old Testament scriptures. Amen. There's nothing about this timeline that was a secret. Right? Right? We didn't, we didn't come along here, and, and nowhere on this timeline do you find any section where the categorization of this is that Israel is going to be blinded to the things of this program while God's doing something else. Amen. Never was that said. Right. From the beginning to the end, God laid it out according to prophecy and said, this is the way it's going to be. You're going to have this number of years here. This is going to be happening. On and on and on and on. God dealt with his nation Israel according to timelines and prophecy yep. that is continuous. Yes. The program is continuous. No mystery, no blindness, nothing. Right. It continues on in a continuous flow, no interruption at all. Right? Nothing revealed as a secret. Now, this is what God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Yeah. Acts 3.21. An interrupt, uninterrupted view of God's prophecy program with the nation Israel. No part of it. As Israel said that they're going to be blind. Yeah. No part of it does God say they're going to see something happening other than what prophecy tells them to expect. Yes. The expectation according to prophecy is that it's going to continue on just the way it was laid out. Yeah. But Paul comes along and we find out that back here, actually before the foundation of the world... God forms a purpose to do something that he says, I'm just going to keep that a secret. I'm not going to tell anybody. I'm going to go ahead with this program. I'm going to create the world. I know what man's going to do in the fall. He's got his purpose with Abraham that he reveals. I'm going to declare my purpose to, to establish my dwelling place on the earth in a kingdom with you. And in your seat, all the families of the earth to be blessed. And in his mind and in his heart, hid in God is this mystery that he's told nobody about. Amen. And everybody's expecting that what God has said, cruising along here, it's all continuous. We know what the consummation of it all is. And all the time, God said nothing about that. That's right. Lord Jesus Christ goes to the cross of Calvary. Princes of this world crucify him, thinking that they are doing damage to God's purpose to set him on David's throne there and to bring Israel back into the land and accomplish his purpose on earth. Yeah. Only to find out that as the program progresses along, and you get here into the, the midpoint of the book of Acts, when it's time for the Lord Jesus Christ from heaven to come back and to execute his wrath in that final segment of Israel's program. Instead of doing that, he comes to one Saul of Tarsus on the Damascus Road. Saves Saul of Tarsus by his grace. And he takes this mystery right here. And he says, now it's time to reveal it. Amen. It's time to make it known. A purpose that I had hid within myself from before the foundation of the world. That's not a part of this timeline. Not a part of prophecy. But a purpose... In the mystery. Amen. To deal with all men, Jews and Gentiles alike, without the distinction of the Abrahamic covenant Amen. and circumcision. But Jew and Gentile can come alike with no difference at all through faith in the gospel of the grace of God made possible by the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And everyone that trusts that gospel of grace is going to be made part of this new creation 
this, uh, this church, the body of Christ, the heavenly people Amen. destined for a mystery purpose in heavenly places up here, yes. distinct and separate from anything that he was talking about right here. Amen. And he says, I'm going to reveal that mystery in time before I conclude what I said I was going to do in prophecy. Amen. And you've got that mystery break coming in there. And when that's revealed, you've now got a segment of time here where what's God going to do with Israel's program? Well, I'm going to put them in blindness in relation to that. Wow. This prophecy timeline is going to pause right there. Right. Before I pour out my wrath, mm -hmm. before I make my glorious power known and return in power and great glory and sit on David's throne, before I do that, I'm going to show mercy and grace to a world of wrath-worthy sinners. I'm going to offer them free grace for an undetermined period of time in my long suffering. And I'm just going to keep Israel's program set on pause right there until the fullness of those Gentiles be come in. Amen. And when I finish my purpose according to grace, I can push the play button right where I left it. Right, I'm going to take that, that body of Christ that I formed of Jew and Gentile alike according to my grace. I'm going to take them out of here Amen. before wrath. Amen. I'm going to deliver them from the wrath. That, they're not appointed to that. Amen. But once I get them out of here, I'm going back to this. And I'm going to pour out that wrath that's been spoken about since the foundation of the world. Fulfill Israel's program. And at the end of that, come back and establish the kingdom on earth. Amen. You can't appreciate this mystery and what it means if you don't understand Israel. Amen. It'll be lost on you. Yes. It'll be lost on you. And you won't understand the doctrine because when he starts talking about no difference over here, that doesn't add up with anything back here. Amen. What am I going to do with all that? Well, that must all be spiritual, right? <laughs> I must be spiritual Israel getting all... No. No. Be not ignorant of this mystery. Israel's in a state of temporary blindness. He's not doing this today. He's doing something else. Look at the doctrine for the something else because that's what you're supposed to be walking in connection with. And when that's completed and all the fullness of the Gentiles be come in, then I'll fulfill my word. In prophecy to Israel, Israel shall be saved Amen. as it's written. Amen. Now, hopefully on the basis of that framework of Israel's program, we can go back to Romans chapter 11 and we can read what Paul says and the exhortation that Paul makes in view of that to be not ignorant of it because it's important. Yes. It's important. You've got to know it. If you don't know it, it's going to shipwreck your edification yes. and you're going to allow Satan to have an advantage of you. And you're not going to be work, walking worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. Amen. Be not ignorant of this mystery and Israel's temporary blindness. Amen. 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 We'll pick it up there next time. Thank you for your patience today. Our God and our Father, we're grateful for the time this morning. We thank you for the truth of the Word of God. We thank you for the whole counsel of God. And Lord, how we can see it worked out through time and the, really the, the matchless genius of God that has been made known by it. Lord, you call that your manifold wisdom. And Lord, we have the privilege of glorying in it, rejoicing in it. And we're thankful that we serve the only wise God this morning who has made his purpose throughout time known to us in his holy word. Pray, Father, in the continuance of the study in the weeks to come that you continue to give us a fruitful understanding and the knowledge of your will. And we give you the thanks and praise for what's accomplished. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.